Act 1. Smoking Kills. Let's go back to the 1960s United States. Man lands on the moon. The Corvette Stingray is born. Oh, and smoking is very much in vogue. You're driving to work, at work, and at the bar after work. You light up and inhale to your heart's content. Cigarette executives are thrilled. Sales of cigarettes per adult per day reach an all-time high. Only a decade or two later, we reap what we sowed. Deaths from lung cancer peak in the US. As the rates of smoking come down, so do deaths from lung cancer. Cigarette companies don't care about the health of their customers. Never mind the burden that smoking places on healthcare. They just want you to smoke the next cigarette. It's no holds barred at this point. James Bond smokes like a chimney. The McLaren Formula One cars have Marlboro printed on their sides. But when you smoke, does it make you shoot like 007? Or take a corner like Ayrton Senna? Hardly. The veil of sophistication, masculinity and adventure is illusory. But what does this have to do with smartphones? United Kingdom 2021. Smartphones are ubiquitous, and it's no wonder. They give us the new holy trinity. Endless entertainment, social media, and the almighty newsfeed. Whether you're at the bus stop, at work, or on a hot date, you can never be bored again. Joe Rogan is sitting next to you at the bus stop. You work to the tune of your favorite playlist. If your date turns out unsuccessful, don't worry, you know just where to go. Everything you ever wanted is right at your fingertips. Smartphones are like an oasis in the middle of the desert of our boring daily lives. So, what's the problem? Act 2. The Invention of Smartphones 4th of January 2007. Steve Jobs unveils the iPhone. It's said to change the world. It can call and text like a normal phone, and it has a nifty little touchscreen. However, unlike previous phones, it's connected to the internet. The world is now truly your oyster. However, this is only the beginning. The real power of the internet lies in distributed computation. Initially, Steve Jobs didn't want others to make apps on his platform. Indeed, he didn't even think of the iPhone as a platform. It was just a better phone. But then, everything changed. 10th of July 2008. The Apple App Store is released. This is the real game changer. Previously, the app economy was based on centralized planning. Apple had to figure out what their customers wanted, make the product and distribute it. Once the App Store was open to all contributors, it replaced centralized planning with distributed computations. Whoever made the best app won. Whichever app people wanted would prevail. A hierarchy emerged, based entirely on one thing. The ability to grab and hold the user's attention. In come the social media platforms. Facebook, Twitter and YouTube make their way onto the smartphone. They are no longer confined to the personal computer. They are now in your pocket. Miracle of miracles, these powerful platforms stay free. But as the saying goes, if the product is free, then you are the product. Bring in the ad revenue. Companies want you to buy their products. Hence, they advertise to you. This requires your attention. The more ads you look at, the more money the social media company makes. They therefore need three components. To get you on the platform, to keep you on the platform, and to keep you coming back. To do this, they ask you what you want. Which sound gets you to open the app? Which type of content keeps you engaged? Which feature makes you come back for more? Behold, the algorithm. Act 3. How the algorithm controls you. 
The algorithm is the editor of the social media platform. It decides which post goes on your front page. Much has been said about the algorithm from the content creator's perspective, but what about the consumer? As we explored, the company itself wants your attention. The algorithm is simply the henchman doing the company's bidding. Hence, the algorithm has to measure your attention. It measures what you like, who you subscribe to, and what keeps you coming back. These are all measures of engagement. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad for you. It wants you to click, stay on, and return as often as possible. That's how the algorithm profits the company. This shifts the paradigm on its head. Likes, dislikes, and followers are not there for the consumer. They're not there for the content creator either. They're there for the company. They are measures of attention used empirically to extract more attention. What gets attention gets promoted. What people come back for gets shown to a greater crowd. This is what distributed computation is all about. These companies don't know beforehand what you like. However, such prior knowledge is made redundant by the algorithm. You show the algorithm what you want. All the algorithm needs to do is pay attention to your attention. That's all well and good, but what has it got to do with smoking? I believe the link is dopamine. Nicotine is the addictive compound in cigarette smoke. It binds to dopamine receptors in the brain. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter responsible for many things. Among them are feelings of pleasure and desire. Smoke itself is irritant, tastes terrible and ultimately kills you. Yet many keep coming back for more. That's because the nicotine trained them to want it. The algorithm does the same. When you see the right piece of content, you get an internal hit of dopamine. The algorithm trains itself to give you the best content from this perspective. In training itself to give you the best content, it also trains you to return more often and for longer. As a result, you view more ads. That's why social media platforms use such algorithms. And that's how the algorithm keeps you hooked. Act 4. The Mental Consequences of Smartphone Use Remember the three things that smartphones give you. Entertainment, social media, and news about the whole wide world. I believe that the evils of smartphone use are the precise counterparts of these benefits. Entertainment takes away your productivity. Social media makes you unnecessarily self-conscious. The news feed that you think informs you actually twists your worldview into a knot. Let me explain. Recall the basic principle of the algorithm. What gets the most attention on a platform rises to the top. This principle shows us the dark side of each benefit. The most attention-worthy entertainment takes your attention away from the sources of intrinsic meaning in your life. The most attention-worthy people on social media have lives so perfect that they make you feel rotten in comparison. The most attention-worthy news piece is the biggest catastrophe that's going on at the moment. This makes you think that the world is much worse than it actually is. These three disadvantages are just the extreme versions of the three benefits of smartphones. This brings us to the idea of the positive feedback loop. It's the technical term for a cycle that gets out of control. It is therefore also called a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle, depending on the outcome. When someone does something attention-worthy, people focus on it. The algorithm notices this and distributes the piece of content to more people. The content creator learns that this is how to get attention and creates more of the same. People then pay more attention to it, and the algorithm promotes the person more. Thus, the amount of attention that the platform grabs from its audience increases over time. Attention begets attention. That's the inbuilt nature of these platforms. Smartphone use therefore has many inbuilt positive feedback loops. As smartphone use escalates, the disadvantages emerge. 
Escalating consumption of entertainment saps your productivity, making you lazy. Escalating viewing of others' perfect lives makes you increasingly self-conscious, causing you to feel inferior. Escalating consumption of the news makes you pay less and less attention to the beauty of life around you, making you hopeless. All this culminates in you feeling worse and worse about your life. Unless... Act 5. Burst the bubble. Now, I must acknowledge the benefits of smartphones. They provide quick and easy communication and access to encyclopedic knowledge about everything imaginable. My problem with them is that they foster a relationship of dependence. And to answer the question of the title, no, smartphones aren't the new smoking. Smoking is clearly worse for one's health. Now, if one is dependent on their smartphone for entertainment, social validation, and their worldview, I believe that the downsides likely outweigh the benefits. So, allow me to suggest an alternative. This is a flip phone. It texts and calls like a smartphone. This particular model, the Nokia 2720, has some additional quirks. It's got Google Maps and WhatsApp. It even has a modern version of the Worm game. However, I did prefer the old one. I've been using this for the past three months. I did this precisely as an antidote to the three evils of smartphone use. It does have YouTube, Facebook and a news feed brought to me by a 4G connection. However, with a tiny 2.8 inch display, I simply can't be bothered. As a result, I check my phone far less often and I never binge on it. At first, this was really weird. I picked up my phone to check notifications and there was nothing. I couldn't scroll endlessly like I was used to. It was also quite inconvenient at times. I couldn't order at the pub with this. I couldn't use it as a train ticket. I therefore had to make some concessions and occasionally use my smartphone for very specific purposes. However, all in all, I consider this a worthwhile switch. I'm more productive than I've ever been. I'm more confident about myself, especially in social interactions. I'm also more hopeful about the future of our species and our planet. So, is this right for you? The only way for you to find out whether or not this would work for you is to try it out for yourself. In the description, I've put an affiliate link to Amazon. If you want to, you can buy the phone and see for yourself. Just plug in your nano SIM card and see how you get on. Keep the smartphone though. The Nokia 2720 has a hotspot feature, which allows you to use your smartphone for necessary tasks. However, don't carry your smartphone with you wherever you go. That would defeat the purpose. Only use your smartphone when absolutely necessary. In hindsight, the £90 this phone cost me was money well spent. Who knows, maybe you too would find it useful. Admittedly, I don't know if I'll continue this forever. I'm in medical school and I suspect I will find some smartphone apps useful once I become a doctor. However, I will definitely be more mindful about my smartphone use in the future. Admittedly though, this kind of change is not for everyone. Even if you decide not to go old school like me, I hope you will be more cognizant of your smartphone use in the future. Thank you for watching. Congratulations for making it this far, and thank you so much. Since you watched till the end, I would like to find out what made you stick. Please comment down below what made you watch till the end, so that I can give you more of what you want in the future. You can find my blog at aro.blog and my Instagram with the same name. Both are linked in the description. The description also contains the bibliography of this video. Like I said, please let me know what made you watch till the end, and you will get more of that soon. Thank you for watching, bye bye.